In this issue, we will get acquainted with the most rare representative of every fauna of Kazakhstan, the Turkestan ground jay or Jorga togai, as the locals call it, the pacing bird. It got its name because it moves in a quick pacing or stepping manner, as if hurrying somewhere on some urgent and important errands known only to itself. They say encountering this bird brings luck, but in our days it became rather difficult to meet this bird of happiness amidst the boundless deserts of Sari Yisik and Tirao. The desert is too vast and there are very few Turkestan ground jays left. Nevertheless, ornithologist Altai Jatkanbayev from Kazakhstan Institute of Zoology knows where and how to find it. For many years now, he has been coming to Pribalkashia or Lake Balkash region during icy and cold winters, in summer heat, during spring when the roads turn into mud as well as in the fall, try to understand where after all the pacing bird is rushing and how to ensure that the future generations of Kazakhstanis have a chance of seeing its extended trot. He was the first one to catch this rare bird on video and make several small discoveries thanks to which we learned more about the nature of Kazakhstan. Central Asia has been attracting adventurers since the times of Marco Polo. In their notes, medieval mavericks filled this semi-mythical area at the world's end with fantastic creatures and unprecedented miracles and riddles. To this day, this mysterious region attracts Western tourists with its landscapes and biological diversity. Together with the Outdoor KZ TV expedition, you will travel to the most picturesque corners of Central Asia, get acquainted with its flora and fauna and immerse yourself in the everyday life and traditions of the people living in the wild. What is the first place you need to go to if you need information about rare animals or birds? No doubt, Kazakhstan Institute of Zoology. Here, this small lab of the Institute of Zoology is, if I may say so, the general staff of studying the Turkestan ground jay in Kazakhstan. The scientific name of the bird is Podosus banderi. He was named so by the nature scientist Fischer von Bandheim in honor of Christian Panda. He wrote about this in article of 1821 in French, the letters by D. Panda to Moscow Imperial Society of Nature Scientists. For the first time, the Turkestan ground jay was encountered in 1820 in the Kizilkum Desert by the natural scientists Christian Panda and Eduard Eversman on the way of Alexander Fyodorovich Negri's embassy to Bukhara. The expedition crossed the Serdarya River, then the Kizilkum Desert and arrived in Bukhara in 1821. Panda Christian Ivanovich scientist, traveler across Central Asia and first paleontologist of Russia, zoologist, biologist and evolutionist. Eversman Eduard Friedrich, doctor, natural scientist, botanist and zoologist, participant of the embassy caravan to Bukhara. From Bukhara, disguised as a Tatar merchant, Eversman tried to reach India, but that mission failed due to a number of reasons. 100 years after the discovery, in 1910 and 1913, Vladimir Nikolaevich Shnitnikov organized two expeditions to southern Pribalkashia, specifically to study this bird. In 1915, they, together with Professor Mensbier, published the article about the Turkestan ground jay in the journal Knowledge Materials on the Fauna and Flora of the Russian Empire. Shnitnikov Vladimir Nikolaevich, biogeographer, doctor of zoological sciences, professor and writer who devoted 45 years to the study of Kazakhstan's wild nature and considered it his second homeland. The author of many articles and books, including the monography The Burns of Semirechia. In 1946, he was awarded the title of the Honored Worker of Science of the Kazakh SSR. Mensbier Mikhail Alexandrovich, zoologist and zoological geographer, ornithologist, full member of the USSR's Academy of Sciences. 
Ornithologist Zarudny, who in 1914 completed the marine expedition across the Aral Sea, jointly with Prince Kudashev, in his paper The Birds of the Aral Sea of 1916, identified the subspecies of Saxul or Turkestan J as Podotsa's Banderi transcaspius. Zarudny Nikolai Alekseevich, zoologist, ornithologist and geographer, researcher of Central Asia, traveled to Transcaucasia, Persia, Afghanistan and Baluchistan. In 1906, together with Kareev, he published the paper The Ornithological Fauna of the Semirechi Region. So it appears there are three subspecies. The article that I found in the Internet told only about two. Many ornithologists, me including, share the view that there are three subspecies. The nominative Saxoul brown jay lives in the Kizilkum desert, the Transcaspian one in the Karakum, and the Turkestan ground jay only in southern Balkash region. All three subspecies are included in the regional red books of Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, and Turkmenistan. Today we are interested only in the Turkestan ground jay, the most rare subspecies with a rather small habitat area. My monitoring sites are located in southern Pribalkashia, about 400 to 450 kilometers away from Almaty. I go there during all seasons and every time there are certain difficulties. Just recently I went there with a friend of mine and my expedition partner Nulan Dosov. It was still winter then with a lot of snow. We had to practically dig our way through. We are trying to open the curtain of mystery and shed light on this true nature. This is the most natural shelter that can be used for zoological observations. We had installed photo and video traps, and now it is time to check them. Baljan and you can join me. Is it a territorial type of bird? Does it keep to one and the same area both during winter and summer? Yes, it is strictly territorial. In case one of the partners in a couple dies, as it happened last year when the nesting female was killed by the desert raven, a single male can leave his plot for two months or so searching for a mate. What other enemies does it have? In addition to the mentioned above desert raven, it is fox, wolf, step cat and different birds of prey. Recently magpies came to the areas where ground jays nest. They too can be a threat to jays. What about humans? People, of course, don't hunt the Turkestan ground jays. Nevertheless, at the time of industrial Saxoul timber harvesting, centuries-old Saxoul forests suffered a lot. In nature, everything is interconnected, and so violation of one part of an ecosystem or a biome may bring unexpected anthropogenic damage to its other parts or parts. Having been observing the Turkestan ground jay for several years, Altai noticed that in recent years it started nesting on average about 20 days earlier than before. What is the reason for that? Is it an accidental vagary of the weather or a sign of global warming? Altai Jatkanbaev believes that it is indeed due to the impact of the global warming trend. In the course of the last 30 years, the water level in Balkash Lake increased by more than one meter. During the same time, the glacier area in the northern Tianshan has reduced by 20%. Are these processes connected? You see, all things in our world are interconnected. 
What an interesting world we live in after all. You snap a rope and start pulling it, and it suddenly turns that it is only the beginning of a cause and effect chain, which can be pulled indefinitely, basically until the beginning of time. In this case, it all began when Altai Zhatkanbaev noticed that the Jays were starting their nesting activity about two weeks earlier than they did, say, 35 years ago. It would seem something insignificant. Well, a great birdie is jumping around, pecking sexual seeds and hiding from this sporty cat or fox ready to eat it. Nothing really dramatic and no intrigue. But having started to pull on this thread, we see a real drama here, a plot that a life will not be enough to solve the tangle. In 1913, a famous researcher of Kazakhstan and Central Asia, Professor Vladimir Nikolaevich Shnitnikov, took his 15-year-old son Arseny on an expedition across the Semirechia. The journey impressed the young man so much that having graduated from the university, Arseny Vladimirovich Shnitnikov devoted his whole life to hydrogeography and climatology. Exploring Lake Balkash and the glaciers of Central Asia, he developed the theory of the recurring water modes of the planet, which is now called the Shnitnikov's theory. Most likely, the work published by his father in 1924 to the issue of water level fluctuations in Central Asian lakes gave him an additional incentive. I came back to Balkash in 1934, when the lake was drying out wrote Arseny Vladimirovich, and recalled how I stood with my father on the same coast in 1913. How deep Balkash Lake was back then? That was the first time when I thought that fluctuations of the lake water level could be subject to long-term variability. Arseny Shnitnikov noticed the link between climatic changes and water cycle fluctuations. He assumed that the recurrence of climatic changes can depend on poorly studied space radiation and other global phenomena. Ancient lakes and glaciers increased and decreased in volume as living and pulsing tissue. Sometimes it led to environmental disasters. Certain species could die out and their place was taken by other ones. We humans ourselves had survived the last glaciation by a narrow margin. So much information in just 30 minutes. Let's keep everything in order. We are going to the desert to look for ground jay that was discovered by Vladimir Shnitnikov, and that could assist us in understanding the theory by Arseny Shnitnikov explaining water level fluctuations in Lake Balkash, exactly on the coast of which there lives the jay researched by Altai Zhatkanbaev. Did I get it all right? It's like a children's counting rhyme. This is the bird of the cheerful kind stealing the wheat in between times, the wheat that is kept in the shadowy barn part of the house that Jack built. Now that the lesson was learned and rehearsed, we can move on. The children's rhyme can serve as an illustration of Vernatsky's law that everything is connected with everything. Baljan is now allowed to field practice. The distance from Almaty to the monitoring sites of Altai Zhatkanbaev is about 400 to 450 kilometers. Not rushing your way, you can get there in 6 to 7 hours. Today we will be performing a rather interesting and complicated task. In the enormous desert of Sariya Sik Atarao, we will try to locate a very small and rare birdie, Turkestan ground jay. Perhaps it would be impossible to do it if we didn't have Altai Zhatkanbaev with us. He is a famous ornithologist and the author of movies about wild nature. He devoted many years to study the Turkestan ground jay and no doubt knows more about this bird than anybody in Kazakhstan and in the world. The matter is that this jay species lives only in Balkash district of Almaty region. To collect data about it, it was necessary to make dozens of expeditions during different seasons of the year, in winter, spring and in summer. Now we are on the border of the Li Delta and Sari Yisik Atarao Desert. In the settlement of Agdala, the expedition stops by the house of Zeynatullah Baidabalov, a friend of Altai's, to 
to take additional equipment. It is very important not to forget anything. Going to the mountains, one needs good boots and an ice axe. Going to Prebalkashia, one needs boots and a mosquito net. No need for the mosquito net. No mosquitoes there now. Left of the Bakanas route, there snakes the Ili floodplain, and the sandy desert of Sariyusik at Arau stretches right of it. Turning right off the road and moving eastwards by Azimuth, you will probably meet not a single person for the next 200 kilometers until reaching the Karatal floodplain. Only Saxal woods, sand dune ridges, white takers and ancient beds of dried up rivers. Once the Bakanas area was rich with water and life was boiling here. They built caravanserais on the coast covered with boundless rustling reeds. Lakes were full of fish. The Tugai jungle were home to herds of boars and to run tigers. But several hundred years ago, the river changed its course, which happens to desert rivers from time to time. For centuries, their muddy waters would carry millions of tons of sand and silt that with time accumulated in their mouths, created shallows and bars, and gradually blocked the water's flow. But the water will always wash itself a new path. In this case, the Ili Delta shifted 150 kilometers to the west. Both humans and semi-aquatic animals and birds followed it away from the Sariusik Atarau Desert, and the waterless sands grew over with saxoal forests later occupied by desert animal species. After the death of the Aral Sea, the delta of the Ili River became the biggest in Central Asia. A huge triangle with a base of 150 kilometers and 100 kilometers high. Its top approximately falls on the settlement of Kogjidin, where the Ili starts to split into separate arms. Asphalt Road is coming to its end at the village of Karaoi. Beyond it, the only option is the extensive network of country dirt roads. The Narin Canal is the most eastern in the system of the Ili Delta and can be called the borderline between the river delta and the desert. The expedition will stop over in the house of Bagbakti Sholpanbekov. A local and an old friend of Altai sometimes joining him in field missions. Karakui Rik, Karakui Rik, Karakui Rik. Did you see it? It was a stag. Did you see it? And who knows what type of animal this is? Who can answer? Bats, turtle, turtle, step turtle. What about this one? Who can tell? Hedgehog. It's a hedgehog. It is time for children to go to bed, whereas adults will talk some more about the fate of southern Balkash region. In the former hard times, in lean years, we survived only thanks to wild animals and birds. In these ends, in the desert, there is a legend that says, in Prebalkashia, under each bush there is a hare, or a bird. And our ancestors knew that they would not starve here and urged us to stay and live here. Balkash reeds were home to the last tigers. I don't remember when exactly, but I do remember when they killed the last one of them. I heard it myself. Fires are the main enemy of nature. When the reeds burn, then everything that lives inside of them dies too. Birds and their nests. Everything perishes. Early in the morning, the expedition packs up its things as it is time to move out to the desert on the search of wild animals. One representative of Desert Fauna decided to come to the photo session itself. 
The main difference between photo and regular hunting is the variety of potential trophies. For a photo hunter, even a small grey gecko, despite its modest size, can be a worthy prize. In Russia, this species is considered extinct and is listed in the Red Book of the Russian Federation. Here it climbed our backpack on its own ready for the photo shoot. We will mark the route points on our GPS and then we'll go on our way. Last century they conducted industrial-scale succole timber harvesting around the village of Karaoi. The traces of those events are still visible today as it takes a long time for succole woods to recover. Two succol species grow in Pribalkashia, black and white. They are very similar, but the groves of white succol are lighter than of the black one, as its bark is whitish ashy. Young succol sprouts remind of scoring rush or horsetail. Examining the branch closely, you can see that the rudimentary leaf of white succol continues with a bristle-formed top, whereas the black succol's leaf is more like a tiny hillock. This is the difference between the leaves of two saxol species. This is all what has remained of saxol leaves as it said goodbye to its foliage in the course of evolution. In the desert, you need to save moisture. The smaller the leaves area, the less is the evaporation. Using branches instead of leaves for photosynthesis, saxol is losing to deciduous plants as to growth speed, but undoubtedly wins as to its life expectancy. This tree here, for example, is certainly over 100, 120 years old. We can call it a contemporary of the olden era. Near this tree, Professor Shnitnikov could very well set up his camp. Or the Turan tiger could very well use it to sharpen its claws. Caravaneers could very well tie their horses to it on their way to Agashayak fortress. In Kazakhstan, they respect senior people. All trees, the silent witnesses of the past times and tragedies, are too very much distinguished among the people. Even during mass saxaul harvesting, the woodcutters wouldn't touch them. During the 16 years of his research, Altai found more than 30 inhabited nests of Turkestan ground jay. An individual site of a jay couple is about 200 to 350 hectares. The total area of the Sariyasik Atarau Desert is about 2 million hectares. On foot, a person can carefully survey at most 30 to 50 hectares per day. Putting together a simple equation, in order to find the ground jay surveying the desert hectare by hectare, it will take 133,000 days or 370 years. Although speaking the truth, the ornithologists don't hope for sheer luck. They analyze birds' behavior and know places where the probability of encountering them is the highest. The researchers go from Barkan to Barkan but see no traces of the mysterious bird. The desert has an even surface, up and down, up and down. I thought it to be a lifeless place but there are so many animals here, although very tiny. Whose voice is that? It's the great gerbil. It attentively watches Baljan but does not show any signs of concern so far. Baljan did not make the impression of a dangerous predator, but it doesn't hurt to be on alert. This very gerbil is old and smart. It has been living in this sand dune for three years, which is quite a respectful age for gerbils. From the shelter, dozens of attentive eyes are observing the old gerbil. They live in family clans of up to 20 individuals.
The Saxawool brunch is so good and tasty. Yummy! Science knows about more than 100 gerbil species, although out of them, 30 species have become extremely rare. There is somebody's hole, of a gerbil probably. While on the territory of great gerbil colonies, it is better not to touch anything with your hands, as gerbils can serve carriers for plague vectors. The best way is to examine the surroundings carefully from the crests of sand dunes. Exactly at this time, the jays begin to actively patrol their plots. The desert is so huge that it will probably take us several days to try to find this birdie. I have a friend who is serving in special forces. So he told me that they walked in the desert for 10 days in the summer. Now I went only 500 meters away from Altai and already got lost. Altai knows the approximate borders of Jay's individual sites, but even precisely knowing where the Jay lives, it isn't easy to find it. We need to come to weather-beaten tops of sand dunes. This is where, most likely, we will be able to find their tracks. Here come the first tracks, fresh ones. This is what their characteristic track looks like. Here, did you see it? He walked right here. Here it started to run. It happened today. Here are the traces of its claws. Do you see? It steps. One, two, three, four. This is a sparrow. No, it's not a sparrow. It's too big for a sparrow. Then I'm the first girl in Almaty to actually see the Turkestan ground jay. Untangling traces, the researchers have found a nest. This is the nest of the Turkestan ground jay. One thing to note, here in southern Balkash region, in 99% of cases, Turkestan ground jays organize their nests exactly in saxaul trees. We can truly call this the first outcome of our expedition. We found the nest of Turkestan ground jay. It is still free, but let's not disturb the surroundings and leave this place for the birds to come. Our task is half done. We found some fresh jay tracks and its nest. Now it's time to do the most important thing. Organize a hide and wait for the bird couple. This observing hide is foreign manufactured. It's English. There the bird watcher movement is very strong. It's a very popular hobby. They also have a whole big British Bird Protection Society. With every 60th citizen of the country as its member. So there are a lot of companies producing various equipment for them, including such hides. I will adjust the camera. And now we have to simply wait. It's hard to say when it will come because the main construction activity usually happens in the morning. Our task is to patiently wait. Patience, patience and even more patience. Who knows how much time we will have to wait? An hour, a day or maybe a week? 
But look! Something flashed in Saxol thickets. Somebody decided that it's too boring for us to sit in the hide and organized a real concert for us. Translated into the human language, this song could sound the following. What is happening here? Who dares to trespass my personal plot without invitation? Get away immediately, because my rage will be terrible. Oh darling, what's going on? I beg you, don't get in the fight. I will observe from here. My darling, I see everything. You are my hero. Darling, wait, I cannot see anything from there. Let me come a little closer. Do you see, my dear, the enemies were scared away by my combat song? Yes, darling, I see. You are my true and only hero. I don't know about you, but I need to have a bite. Let me check on our nest. Do you need any help, sweetie? No, dear, keep an eye on our nest and I will go to find something to eat. Earlier, poets thought the trill of a songbird to be an anthem of love, but modern mythology claims that it is rather a war call. With the song, the male warns potential rivals that the territory with a radius of 100 meters around his nest is his private property, and without a deadly fight, he will not give it up to anybody. The bravery and the fighting spirit of a jay, as well as many other birds, have an exact mathematical equivalent. It is basically measured by distance from the nest. The closer to the nest, the higher the male bird's determination is to defend his personal plot, and the further he departs from the nest, the more quietly and modestly he behaves. Animals and birds are great actors. They are so natural that it is possible to observe them for days uninterrupted. But while in a field expedition, one also needs to take care of such prosaic things as sustenance. It is time to set up the camp, cook some food, and think about how not to freeze during the upcoming night. I am really tired. I will go to the truck and make some lunch. Household routine in any expedition is a rather important issue, and in desert conditions especially. There are no supermarkets, so you have to think about everything and prepare it in advance. The issue of food in field conditions deserves separate attention. It is enough to write a whole adventure novel about it. Now you will see how the 21st century meets with the last millennia. Altai will cook our lunch on fire and I will make some coffee using the gas burner. How to spend the night in the desert on the cold ground and not to catch a cold? To start with, you need to find and collect the fallen saxaul branches. Breaking a fresh tree could get you into serious trouble. Harvesting saxaul is strictly forbidden. Then you need to make a fire. When the soil gets really warm with fire, you need to rake away the coals and cover the place where the fire was burning previously with some fresh sand. You should leave absolutely no smoldering sparks. After that, you need to level the ground even in order to make it suitable for putting up the tent. Listen, it's really warm in here. Let me be the manager of this hotel and show you around our lodging for tonight. We have a luxury suite, a double luxury suite and a presidential suite. The sand in here will serve us as a sofa. At half past eight, it gets dark. It is too early to sleep, but it's the best time to sit around the fire and recollect previous journeys and plan the future ones. When the expedition was getting ready to go to the desert, it was quite cold and suddenly the weather turned really warm. The saline soils got muddy with spring water and the roads promptly began to turn into mud traps. We suppose it's time for us to get out of here. 
By habit, I almost said that our expedition to research the Turkestan ground jay is finished and it is time for us to return home. In fact, it is indeed time for us to go back home. But the expedition is not finished yet. To get the full picture of the biology and behavior of this most rare bird, we will need to come back here to southern Balkash region and Sariusik Atarau Desert more than once.